You should see it go live in just a minute. Stop looking too serious. All right. It looks like we are just about live. All right, I think we're there. Can, can you check and see if it's on the Facebook, please? All right, we're live now. Welcome everyone to another edition of Being Human Church. This Sunday we're talking about, if you're a Harry Potter fan, Defense Against the Dark Arts, or what I'm calling Combating uh, Manipulation in the Information Environment, particularly in the Information Age. So I invite you all to join us. So we are on Zoom if you want to participate in the conversation afterward, and that's where we really get to the, the fun stuff when everybody gets to contribute and otherwise enjoy the the talk and i hope it stimulates some thought for you particularly as we're going into an election cycle and just generally existing in the information age so there are some significant perils when it comes to the information environment the reason this is true particularly in the west and the us is because democracy depends on an informed citizenry a citizenry that knows generally what's happening how they contribute and how to hold their elected officials accountable. Because when de democratic citizens hold their elected officials accountable, power remains disaggregated, and so it does not overly corrupt the government. It's also important just to understand truth versus lies, right? What is true? What's a lie? Who's doing it? And why are they doing it? A couple of things I want to establish real quick is uh, a couple of terms that'll be important throughout the rest of the talk. So one is bias. Bias is something usually attributed to a media outlet or a, a personality, and this is something that demonstrates their worldview, right? Do they lean left, as in are they more liberal or progressive? Do they lean right, which is more um, conservative or right-wing Republican? Are they, um, how is a story in particular slanted? And slanted means toward a bias or not. And then there's propaganda. So propaganda has a sort of bad connotation in that it is in itself manipulating, but that's not necessarily true. Propaganda by definition just means information that supports your position, right? It's something that you're trying to use to convince somebody of something. Now, part of the reason it has um, such a bad uh, feeling associated is because of its use of that or the use of that particular word by the Nazis in World War II. And then there's misinformation, which is incorrect information that's propagated whether or not it's done intentionally. And then there's disinformation. And disinformation is um, information that is specifically manipulated or specifically disseminated and targeted to people uh, with the intent to manipulate their, uh, their opinion. And usually disinformation is um, untrue, but that's not always the case. And usually the best disinformation has a kernel of truth to it. 
And so those are some important things to understand how to name things, because um, being able to name things and understand what they are helps to give us a little bit of power over those ideas. One of the key questions I think is important to ask ourselves is who benefits from information? Who benefits from a particular piece of information showing up in front of us? And I think one of the first things we have to realize is that every single piece of information, including what you're seeing from me right now, someone has an intent behind that information. Somebody wants you to do something. And the first question you should always ask yourself is, who wants me to see this and why do they want me to see this? And if you're running that check in your head constantly, it helps to defend you against people manipulating you because you're always asking who's behind it. So with that, I wanna share a um, thing that we have up on our, our uh, website, if I can find it. And that's this right here. So what I'm showing you right here is, you can see where it came from. This is posted on our website, beinghumanchurch.com slash resources. And it's the ultimate check or cheat sheet for critical thinking. And to me, you can go through all of these things to get really in depth. But the first question is to me, the most important, who benefits from this? Who benefits from me knowing or believing or doing the thing that they're wanting me to do? And then the rest of the questions in the who I think are also really important. Who is this harmful to? Who has an interest in this when it comes to information about whether it's a trend or something usually is associated with someone owning a, a business or a share in a business because they make money, um, especially on disinformation, social media in particular, and uh, large tech companies benefit from disinformation and the virality of it. So some other things I want you to see um, that are resources um, that you can find online are the, this is a bias chart. This lists all of the biases, not all of them, but a lot of them that are common and helps you to understand what those are and how they affect you. And yes, they affect you no matter how smart or how well trained you are. Um, these things affect all of us because this is how our brain has developed over time. And then there are logical fallacies. Now these are usually used in an argument um, to distract from something, or it's just a failure of logic. So I wanted to share those with you because those are great resources for you to go and look up on your own to better understand how we deal in the information environment. So I want to read to you uh, a little bit of information I got from a fantasy book. Now you might question why I would be citing a fantasy book, um, but just like many stories throughout human history, um, stories even in the modern age have lessons to teach us. So this book um, or the series is called The Sword of Truth. And it, it's a, a standard fantasy, you know, epic fantasy series. And in this book, they have things called the wizard's rules. Now, the wizard's first rule, I think, is the most important. And all of the wizard's rules really deal with human behavior. So this is the wizard's first rule um, very quickly. People will believe a lie because they want to believe it's true or because they are afraid it might be true. So think about that again. People will believe a lie because they want it to be true or because they're afraid it might be true. I think we see this a lot in today's environment, particularly when it comes to confirmation bias, right? That's basically what that is talking about is we want to believe things that confirm um, what we think, either because we want it to be true or because we're afraid it is true. Now, I want to give you the broader context of that quote in the book because I think it's really important. And then we'll talk about what's important about that. So wizard's first rule, people are stupid. People are stupid. Given proper motivation, almost anyone will believe almost anything. Because people are stupid, they will believe a lie because they want to believe it's true or because they are afraid it might be true. People's heads are full of knowledge, facts, and beliefs, and most of it is false, and yet they think it all true. People are stupid. They can only rarely tell the difference between a lie and the truth, and yet they are confident they can, and so all are, are the easier to fool. People need an enemy to feel a sense of purpose. It is easy to lead people when they have a sense of purpose. Sense of purpose is more important by far than the truth. 
In fact, truth has no bearing in this. People are stupid. They want to believe, so they do. Now that says people are stupid a lot. Um, and no, I don't believe that everyone is stupid in the sense that they're unintelligent or uneducated. However, I do believe that many of us, in fact, most of us, at times, jump to conclusions on something because it's an easier mental shortcut. And this doesn't mean anyone is a bad person. This is how our brains have developed to save energy, to make mental shortcuts, to keep things easy. So what this means is that we need to specifically spend time educating ourselves in ways to overcome this normal human behavior. Because if we don't, we will be led astray by those who aim to manipulate us by giving us that sense of purpose. And I think this is particularly poignant today when it comes to the political divisions we see, particularly in the US, but even around the world. We've been given a sense of purpose by our political tribe. And generally it's become closer to the idea just to make the other side lose, to hate the enemy. And this is how fascism comes about. This is how the beginnings of World War II started. It's easier to scapegoat some group when you're not educated about the root causes of the things affecting you. So this is why I think the wizard's first rule is really, really important to understand. People will believe a thing because they want it to be true or because they're afraid it is true. So whether it's immigrants, whether it's you know the left, the right, people believe things are true about the other groups either because they want it to be true to make it easy to dislike the other side or because they're afraid it is true and that that's their true nature is to be you know truly terrible human beings, but none of it is. So next I wanna talk a little bit about bias, uh, biases and fallacies. So I showed you the charts. Some of the important ones in my view are negativity bias and availability bias particularly in regards to social media. On social media, we see a lot of negative stories, particularly about our political opponents. And because we see those negative stories, that also affects our availability bias. And availability bias is when you see something often enough, it, you begin to think it's true simply because it's the thing you can most easily recall. Now, negativity bias means that the human brain is uh, tends to be wired toward seeing and remembering negative things, which makes sense in the evolutionary perspective, because we want to notice the negative things because those things might kill us. However, in today's world, it's much more nuanced. And so things that are negative, things that make us feel bad, aren't necessarily the same kind of threats that they once were. So those two things together make us think that the world is a lot more terrible place than it actually is. If you spend any amount of time on social media, and there are plenty of studies about this, you tend to get depressed pretty quickly because it's, it seems like the world is a terrible place. However, if you go outside and talk to anyone around you, most people are just going on about their daily lives. I mean, everything's generally fine. The next set of um, biases I want to talk about are confirmation bias um, in combination with availability bias, right? We tend to search out things that confirm our beliefs. And then in terms of availability bias, if we're choosing to only have friends, particularly, again, on social media, that reinforce the views that we already have, that's how we end up with echo chambers. Because we look for that confirmation, we, then we, we see that everyone agrees with us, and therefore we believe that our way of thinking is true, but that's because we have no counter, we have no counterpoint, we have no alternative explanation, we have no one arguing or, or providing the devil's advocate. So it's important to anchor yourselves in a different mindset, to have friends outside of your own scope, to ensure that you don't have flawed thinking because no one's challenging what you think. So the next one um, combines fallacies and, and biases, um, and that's the framing effect, anchoring bias, and then the middle ground fallacy. So the framing effect is something that you would do when you're negotiating. Now, same thing with anchoring bias. If you are going into a, a used car dealership or a car dealership and they start showing you really expensive cars, well, what they're doing is they're anchoring your mind that this is, this is a, 
the normal price of things is expensive and they're going to give you a good deal because it's going to be below that price. But if you had done your research beforehand, you would know that the price is actually much lower. And so you'd be able to mentally anchor yourself to that lower number. The same thing is true when it comes to information and rhetoric, arguing about political positions. It's not simply about saying, well, the crazies on one side are saying this and the crazies on the other side are saying that. And so this middle ground fallacy would be, well, we have to pick something kind of in between. No, that's not true. Neither of those positions may be valid. And so they shouldn't be used to anchor our thinking. So we have to be careful about those things with availability bias, because if it seems like everybody's talking about one particular position, um, whether it's, you know, dis disabolish or disestablishing um, the Affordable Care Act or instituting the Green New Deal, that doesn't mean that we have to meet somewhere in the middle. It means that we have to evaluate the different policies based on their own merits and their outcomes and determine which of them are going to be useful for the country. So the next one is the fundamental attribution error. And this is where for yourself, you attribute things that you did wrong to circumstances. And we talked about this one a little bit before, where if you cut someone off in traffic, you would say, oh, I just didn't notice them, which would be true. Rarely are we ever intentionally trying to be mean to people, right? Never attribute to ignorance or never attribute to malice what you can attribute to ignorance or stupidity. But that means that also for other people that we tend to attribute it to a failure in character. Right? They cut me off because they're a bad person. They voted for Trump because they're, they're you know, deplorables. They voted for Hillary because they're libtards. Right? These ideas where we attribute things to people's character, but for ourselves, we give ourselves a little bit of grace and a pass because we think we have reasons, is, a fun, is, an, is an error in thinking. Right? They have the same kind of valid reasons that we think that we have valid reasons. Now, they're very much like I was mentioning about the framing effect, there might be reasons that they're completely flawed. And that doesn't mean we always have to accept their opinion is valid. In fact, very few opinions are valid. But it's something to remember about ourselves as we go out and think about others that people aren't doing things because they think it's the, the wrong thing to do. They choose things because they think it's the right thing to do. But oftentimes their thinking is flawed. And the last thing I want to talk about is the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So the Dunning-Kruger effect um, basically says that the less intelligent you are, the more confident you are about being right. It's a really dangerous thing and speaks specifically to that wizard's first, first rule that I mentioned earlier. People who are not educated, who are not taught to think critically, who don't have the capacity, will be extremely confident about their position. And this is what happens a lot of times with con conspiracy theorists, that their thinking is so flawed that they're extremely confident about their position. And it's really difficult to reach those people. So it's better, in my view, to intervene beforehand. So a couple other things that um, I had on the other part of my page. Um, so the slippery slope, uh, straw man, ad hominem, the burden of proof, sharpshooter, no true Scotsman, and to quoque. All of those things you're gonna see in the political arguments online. Um, and in the news, basically anything you hear come out of a politician's mouth is generally going to be one of those things. So slippery slope. If you vote for Biden, everything's going to be socialism. That's silly. Um, you know, same thing goes in reverse. The straw man. That's where you say, um, basically, socialism is like this crazy thing. And so therefore, or, or this policy is like this crazy thing. And when they say socialism, usually conservatives, what they mean is Soviet style central government manage, right? So they're, they're setting things off to the side as a straw man to say what you're, what you're talking about is this and this is bad when they're not evaluating the proposal on its merits. An ad hominem attack is attacking the person themselves. Biden has these issues, Trump has these issues and therefore anything they say is, is tainted, right? No policy they say could be valuable because I'm just going to attack their character, something they did 50 years ago, whatever it happens to be. The burden of proof is where you would say, well, prove that the Green New Deal is going to be worth it or prove that um, abolishing the Affordable Care Act is going to be good. It's really difficult to prove something that's not happened. And so what happens is they shift the burden of proof on the person um, trying to propose something uh, versus those trying to argue against that thing. Um, the sharpshooter is when you 
aim at some narrow piece of someone's argument and say, well, if this fo doesn't follow, then the whole argument is kaput, right? That, that the whole thing is not valid and we have to throw it away, which isn't always true. Sometimes there might be a failure in a small piece, but the rest of the idea holds. Um, the no true Scotsman is an argument for purity. Well, you're not a real Democrat if you know you don't vote for the Green New Deal, or you're not a real Republican if you vote pro-choice, right? But none of those things are true because there's no pure anything. So look for those things and look up the chart. And you can kind of play bingo if you want. Whenever you're watching politicians, look for these fallacies because I see them all the time. Then of course, there's the appeal to emotion. And this isn't, uh, it can be effective in persuading people of things, but it's not a valid logical argument. So and I've seen this a lot with abortion stories. So on, on either side where um, it talks about the very detailed stories about mothers going through abortions and regretting it or being glad for it, but being persecuted for it. And so both of them are very emotional and it's a very emotional issue, but it doesn't lead to good policy outcomes because we're not thinking logically about what happens when we turn this into a policy. Instead, we need to evaluate it by detaching emotion to a certain point and saying, what actually drives us to the outcome that we desire? I know for myself, I would like abortions to go down. How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of research on it. Giving people good sex education, access to um, you know, pregnancy prevention, good health care, all of those things drive abortions down. And I think all of us are anti-abortion and we all want to see that number go down. So instead of talking about these stories that are extremely emotional and really are fringe cases, why don't we talk about the policy prescriptions that get us to the end state that we'd like? On that note, by the way, that generally countries that outlaw abortion have higher rates of abortion than countries that don't outlaw and provide good health care. So point, of, point for thought. Um, and then the last one is the black versus white argument, which can actually be related to racism, but is more about painting two ideas as um, exclusionary to each other, right? Socialism versus capitalism. Oh, if you're not capitalist, then you're a socialist. Oh, if you're not, if you don't believe in socialism, then you're, you know, a money-grubbing capitalist. Neither of those things exist in reality in their pure forms. When you, social security has the word social in it, which is the same as socialism to a degree. And America has plenty of capitalism, but there are, are huge, huge amount of regulations on capitalism that keep it from being, um, you know, the robber barons of the early 1900s, where they actually employed thugs to break up and kill union leaders so that people couldn't argue for living wages for themselves. So it's the argument for all or nothing. Now, that was a lot of academics uh, for a Sunday evening, but those things are important because if we know how to name the phenomena we see in the information environment, it makes it much easier to avoid the logical pitfalls that might uh, befall us if we uh, were not as educated. So now I wanna talk a little bit about what you can do, starting with yourself. First thing that I think is really important is to combat decision fatigue. And what that means is you have a limited amount of will in a given day. And there's some good research on this. So look up decision fatigue if you're interested in more. As you go through the day, you lose the ability to make hard choices like, I should not eat ice cream two times because it's not healthy for me, but I'm tired now because it's after work and I've thought about things and I'm going to have another ice cream. When this comes to information, we're overwhelmed with notifications and messages and different media and bits of information. So we should be very structured about how we choose to engage the information in the first place. So personally, what I've done is I've turned off all notifications on my phone with the exception of the phone ringing and texts coming in. Social media, email, all that stuff. I turn off the notifications. So the only thing that comes up on my phone is the little thing at the top of the screen. No buzzes, no dings, no nothing. Because none of those things are timely. I don't, I don't need those to inform me of some important event happening. I check them at my leisure, and generally that's once a day. Email I usually check only a couple times a week. 
And it prevents me from getting dr uh, dragged into this information environment that really isn't that value. It's not providing me information that I need to better myself or survive on a daily basis. So consider that for your first point. And then restrict your intake of information. Choose what sources you get information from. Don't just go out there and, and listen to or watch whatever happens to show up in front of you because those pieces of information show up in front of you for very deliberate reasons. And those reasons are usually that someone's paying to get that information in front of you. So if you go out and do your own searching, your own hunting, yes, Google is still going to give you prioritized uh, bits of information based on your interests, et cetera. But that means that you specifically have to go out and bracket or reframe your information so that you're getting different perspectives. Question how you could be wrong and do so constantly. There's this thing called the curse of knowledge where you don't understand why people don't understand something that you already understand. That was a wordy way to say, it's really difficult um, to understand someone else's perspective. And it is the only way to get over that is to always ask yourself, how might I be wrong? How might what I'm thinking be the wrong way? So you have to be your own devil's advocate, or even better, if you have a good friend, have them be the devil's advocate for you. Because that helps to solidify and strengthen your thinking, your positioning, your reasoning on why you believe or think a certain thing. That critical thinking sh uh, checklist I showed you earlier, run that all the time. Always ask yourself, who benefits from this appearing in front of me? Every time you look at your email, at, that you're on websites, look at the advertisements deliberately and say, hey, that's interesting. Um, a Google phone showed up here because I was searching Google phones the other day. And I know that someone's trying to buy my attention because of the, the cookies that got picked up on this other site the other day is now being fed back into uh, what's, what advertisements are being shown to me. Always run that checklist and be skeptical of what shows up in front of you. And then get smart on information, news, et cetera. So there's a media bias chart. And if you haven't seen it, go just search media bias chart. It's adfontestmedia.com and look at that chart. Now, while I'm sure, and I've heard people argue about, well, this one's not really that far left or that far right or whatever. So I do media analysis for a living. This is literally what I do. And so there are a few on average in the, in the population that understand media as well as myself. And I will tell you that that chart is pretty accurate. Yeah, there might be a couple of degrees difference and any sort of sampling you do is gonna have some margin of error, but it's probably less than 3% in either direction. And that's why they put the big boxes on them to say, these things are generally reputable media. These things you know, in the yellow boxes, you should really start to question. And anything in the red is just trash. And I honestly think actually more stuff should be in the trash category, particularly this year. So be extremely skeptical. If you're gonna go some places for information, go to what are called the wire services and that's Associated Press and Reuters. Both of those generally just report the thing that happened. On this day, a thing happened, here's who said what, the end. They don't have the analysis portion or any of that other stuff. Other news sources will, will use their stories and then add that in. Um, also tend to watch local, I'm talking local news reporting on events particularly things like town, uh, town halls or council meetings to see who said what, what are they talking about and what are the issues? Those are honestly some of the best ways to get your information. And then if you do go to the big news sites, do not, and I repeat, do not watch television news. Don't do it. It's specifically designed to get you emotionally amped up. Remember, appeal to emotion because it's visual and it's auditory. So it's trying to play on your brain to get you emotional, which turns off your front brain, your thinking brain, so that you're not analyzing the news anymore. You're just getting revved up about whatever the topic is. And they throw people on there who start yelling, which again, gets your anxiety up so that you stop thinking. Whether it's, so personally for me, whether it's the debates or whatever else, I read all of my news. I might go back and watch a video clip, but I'm not going to watch a whole story of something because I know it's being designed to manipulate me. So read, bracket yourself, look at things on the left and the right, and but try and stay fairly central. So Wall Street Journal, um, basically any of the financial magazines, 
um, may be accepting Bloomberg, all tend to be slightly on the right. Um, a lot of the other main media, New York Times, Washington Post, tend to be on the left. But they're all in the reputable category because they research their information. And I know because I work with reporters from all of them and answer their questions and I understand how they report. I also like BBC. BBC is probably my favorite for international news. That's where I would go for that. And then social media is trash for news. Now, most people get their news from social media. You need to look every time at what site that piece of news is coming from. If you don't recognize the name of the site, it's probably trash. And if you're interested in that particular topic, if you think that story is important to understand, go look up the topic of the story in your own Google search and then find a reputable outlet, preferably one on either side, and get a better understanding of how the story is being bracketed. Don't just click on whatever's on social media. If you've not seen The Social Dilemma, I would highly recommend that you look into it because all of the social media get money based on click-through because that's how advertisers determine something was effective. So when you click on stuff on social media, you are incentivizing the spread of misinformation and disinformation unless the story happens to be true, which it usually isn't completely because it's usually particularly biased if it's being spread rapidly on social media. And there's a lot, of, a lot of research behind that. I won't go into it here, but pieces of disinformation tend to be more viral because they tend to be more emotional and they're written specifically or, or recorded specifically to do that. And so understand that things that are spreading quickly tend to not be true in some regard. So social media isn't bad for everything. It is good for social movements. We've seen a lot of where people have used social media to, to connect with other people, which is its purpose. It's not to spread news. And so you have to be very careful and very disciplined and honestly hold other to, to others to that same discipline to make sure that we're not spreading um, and propagating disinformation. And then again, remember negativity bias and availability bias. If all we see on social media is bad and we're stuck in our echo chambers, the only things that are available to us are things that reinforce our own opinion and bad things. And that gives us a very skewed worldview, which damages our ability to participate in society in a constructive way. And this is, so emotional manipulation, this is very difficult to defend against. I know because this is what I study. So any time that you can remove yourself from being emotionally manipulated by limiting your sources to what you choose and not just clicking on things that show up in front of you, you will be better positioned. You will have more willpower. You'll be better informed to better participate in the democratic process. So getting beyond yourself though, because in our view of humanism, you have to start with yourself, build yourself up, and then you look to reinforce and build up your family, which expands your circle. And then beyond that, your community to help them as a whole, because humans are communal creatures. So moving to family, discuss news and current events and get people's opinions on and their understanding of what it is. Be each other's devil's advocates, help them refine their thinking processes, help them identify when they're falling into logical fallacies or uh, falling victim to cognitive biases. This shouldn't be a thing that gets people upset or defensive. It should be something that we practice all the time. And it starts honestly with our own families, you know, our, our immediate family, and then should extend to our extended family, your, your parents, your aunts, your uncles. And yes, I understand we all have the, the crazy people in our lives that are the opposite political party and tend to be uh, not very rational. And sometimes you can sway them back to reality by appealing to their humanity and helping them understand that you're a family member who cares about them. And you can't try and shut them down or win debate points. You've really got to engage them. And then in the cases that people aren't going to change, well, the least you can do is to um, counter the crazy that they're trying to put forth in the information environment to the rest of your family to defend them against that sort of misinformation and disinformation. And then teach media literacy. Teach people how to do their own research, like I was talking about earlier, how to do sourcing, how to evaluate sources for reliability, how do they do research, read the about sections in the different media outlets, when were they stood up, what do they represent, 
who owns them. Again, going back to the critical thinking check sheet, understand who benefits from you reading each of those sources. And then you've got to expose your family to discomforting stories and to challenge their opinions. Comfort precludes growth. Or said another way, we can only grow when we're uncomfortable. If we're surrounded by our echo chamber, we cannot learn and we cannot grow. We cannot understand more than we currently understand. So we have to challenge each other and live in a little bit of discomfort. Getting to the community uh, uh, portion of this. First is to facilitate respectful discourse. This is the core reason why I established this church in the first place, is I was worried, and this is in 2018, about our political discourse. It's only gotten worse, so we need more spaces like this where we can have conversations with each other, challenge each other respectfully, and ideally learn from each other and understand that we're all in this together, trying to make a more perfect union. Engage in governance. Go to community meetings. Volunteer with the community. Reach out to the other side of the aisle politically and join together to do something, just whether it's you know clean up roads or provide for the homeless or do whatever. Demonstrate to people that there is still goodness in the world. Again, we're countering availability bias here by showing people that plenty of goodness is still out there. See, here it is. And in that regard, be the change you want to see. And then still, you, we have to correct that um, incorrect information or that misinformation, disinformation. Now, if you go back a couple of weeks, we talked about how to be a humble human, how to really engage people and win, quote unquote, emotional arguments by talking to people to understand them. So I'll let you go back and watch that talk if you'd like. And now I want to talk about the consequences. If we don't do this, if we don't engage in the uncomfortable conversations, we will see our democracy decline and potentially fall apart. I will tell you that as someone who studies this space, Russia in particular aims to create chaos. They're not trying necessarily to change the world. They just want it to be confusing so that they can manipulate people much like a, a, a gang does or a mob does. China, on the other hand, wants to revise the world um, particularly the world order to benefit them specifically. While they have benefited immensely from the structures, the international structures that have been built post-World War II, they now think that they should have even more. And so if there aren't strong societies to challenge them, then the world that we know will change pretty drastically in the coming decades. Our government could definitely become much more authoritarian. The thing about power is that it concentrates over time and without a force to disaggregate it, to spread it out again every so often, it will eventually corrupt, right? Because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So as a democratic society, a representative democracy, it's our responsibility as citizens, as voters. It's not the representative's responsibility to, um, to police themselves, that's our job. And in my view, we've abdicated that job for far too long. And the representative governments require more energy to sustain. Authoritarian governments are pretty good at keeping their thumb on the people and keeping things quote unquote stable, but you lose a lot of rights in that process. If we wanna have a government that is actually representative and, that, and to enjoy the freedoms that we still have, then we have to fight for it and invest the energy and yes, that means we can't watch Netflix quite as often, but we really could probably still enjoy our extremely luxurious lives when you look at it throughout the course of human history. And then also hold our government accountable and be engaged in our own governance. And this is important because order requires more energy than chaos. If you're a physics nerd, um, as I happen to be a little bit, um, entropy is the process of things falling toward chaos. And it always requires entropy to stack things up or, or uh, requires energy, sorry, to stack things up and put them in order. So we have to realize that we're constantly fighting to maintain what we have, the order we have against chaos. There's an interesting saying I, I once heard, um, and this is uh, about the Iraqi people at the time, is that every country has the government it deserves. Think about that. 
every country has the government it deserves. That means that as Americans, we have the government that we deserve. And that's because we choose. Now, even in authoritarian governments, people are like, well, they don't have a choice. And that's not true. You can always choose to fight. You can always choose to resist. You can always choose to engage, to converse. Yes, your life might be at risk, but nothing in this life is free. And that includes um, the freedoms of government. And so the future is only going to be what we are put, going to put energy into. And that starts by educating ourselves, educating our families, and educating our community, and we'll never stop. So we had better get started now and keep up the work if we want to continue to live the lives that we enjoy, if we want our children's future to be better than ours, and to live in a world where human progress can continue. I thank you all for joining me this evening. I hope this was helpful to you to help prepare your minds for the infinite battle that is human progress. I hope you'll join us afterwards for some additional conversation, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.